For scheduling reasons, we've driven the shark down to Portugal on a trailer, then a five-day crossing to Las Palmas. For a sea crossing from Spain or Portugal to the Canaries, summer is the best season. Sailors are spared the stress of spring and autumn storms. But on just the third night, we do encounter turbulent weather. Although by the next morning, the wind starts to die down. That little appetizer has reassured us that we and our ship are well equipped for an odyssey on the high seas. On one night in that first section, we had to force eight or nine storm for four or five hours, which was quite a challenge. I'd never seen such gigantic waves like that before. But I've read up on the subject, so I knew what to expect. Our plan is to take the northeast trade wind and, supported by the northern equatorial current, sail to the Caribbean. In German, the passage is called the barefoot route, due to the subtropical climate and steady winds. In this case, the best time to sail is between November and April, when the Caribbean is hurricane-free. Ahead of us lie 3,000 miles of open ocean, and without a single supermarket in sight, that means taking along a lot of rations. Absolutely vital, fruit and vegetables that only ripen midway through the journey. Although, in a boat of this size, your stowage options are pretty limited. The shark lies low in the water as we set sail from Las Palmas, pitching like a barge. Together with the food and equipment, the boat weighs in at half a ton. We attach a 30-meter long rope to the stern, a lifeline in case one of us should unwillingly go overboard. The weather is warm, and we're making good progress with the northeast wind. Perfect conditions for a southerly course into the trade wind zone. But after just 130 sea miles, a setback. The port side lower shroud is broken. We substitute it with a Dyneema rope, extremely snap proof but vulnerable to wear. So that stock gap will require daily inspection checks. We made such an effort to get everything into mint condition beforehand. We did everything we could to exclude the possibility of something getting broken. And largely we managed that. But of all the things, the lower shroud breaking, which was supposed to have one and a half times the resistance of a regular shroud, was a real disappointment. I just don't understand how that's possible in this day and age, when you buy such a vital piece of equipment. While shrouds can at least be replaced, some equipment simply must not fail. The wind vane self-steering at the stern works according to a straightforward mechanism. The angle between the wind and the boat's course is transferred onto a wind vane. When the boat changes course, the vane swings out and in turn steers an auxiliary rudder. That rudder is linked to the tiller via ropes and chains and brings the shark back on course. And nobody needs to spend much time manning the tiller. Steering a boat by hand with a two-man crew for weeks on end is simply not possible. After a few days, the strain would be so exhausting that the trip would become torture. And in order to ensure both of us get a decent night's sleep, we have an active radar reflector on board. If a big ship comes our way, for example, we'll be alerted by a sound. We spent a year preparing for the crossing, 
More than a year, actually. So we shouldn't have left anything out. Sure, there are a few little things we did forget, like the odd book or CD, or a movie on the computer. But it's not the end of the world. After three days, we've covered 266 sea miles. And of course, we do have all the crucial things on board. Two men in a small boat take on the barefoot route across the Atlantic. They encounter whales, perform tricky repairs, and catch plenty of fish. See all the things that can happen, and all the gear you absolutely need to make the crossing on Barefoot Across the Atlantic in a Shark 24.